before this, I have to tell you about Jay Feinberg. So, in fact, I never wrote a paper with Jay Feinberg, but I think that compared to many of the people here who wrote papers with Jay Feinberg, I have influenced his research more than most <laughs> by doing what? By exporting Eran <laughs> Buchbinder. Now, <laughs> but, but you have to realize, you know, you have to realize something important. In Israel, if a student refuses to go abroad for a postdoc, he or she are dead academically. But Eran and Jay work was so good that it went over the rough, as we say here in Israel, and therefore we are all blessed that you still have Eran with us. <laughs> now, all the good things that you heard about Jay before are probably right, but hey, Jay has a big flaw. And probably the flaw results with the fact that he grew up in Philadelphia. <laughs> so people in Philadelphia have no idea about Renaissance culture and things as <laughs> like this. So he calls Leonardo Mr. Da Vinci. <laughs> now this is as if you called Erasmus of Rotterdam Mr. of Rotterdam, <laughs> or if you call J. Feinberg of Jerusalem Mr. of Jerusalem. <laughs> so I made the point to him several times, but he's so ingrained in his Philadelphia upbringing <laughs> that he still <laughs> gives lectures with Da Vinci. So please, <laughs> do me a favor. Anyway, what I want to talk to you about is subjects that are very close to what we heard so far in the previous thing, but I'll give you a very different outlook on the same problem. So <coughs> let me start, because nobody actually explained what are glasses. Now, many of you know, but some maybe don't know. So let me start with glass phenomenology. Many of you have seen this picture before, but nevertheless, let me remind you. We have a liquid phase diagram. This is the specific volume. This is the temperature. And the liquid, when you cool it down, the specific volume goes down, becomes more condensed. And there is a melting temperature. Where when you go close and slow, it will melt and make a crystalline solid. Now, if you quench fast, you don't allow the system to do the phase transition, it goes into a supercooled regime. And water does it, glycerol does it, many materials do this. And when you go to the supercooled regime, if you continue to cool, there is what we call the glass transition, which is a somewhat ill-defined concept because the glass transition depends on the protocol. Do you do it slowly or rapidly? But the point is that at some point, the specific volume as a function of temperature has the same slope as the one of the crystal, and indeed, the material becomes solid. What is what does mean become solid? Well, we know the difference, right? When you put a, a strain, a fluid flows. When you put a strain on a solid, there is an elastic response and it doesn't flow. So this happens. And the, uh, this, uh, this is because the phenomenon is that the viscosity can shoot up here, for example, for glycerol, it can shoot up 14 orders of magnitude within a small range of temperature. And this is when the system becomes so uh, viscous that on a human time scale, it's not a fluid, it's a solid. We do know, however, for example, in Israel, when you look at Roman glasses, uh, from 2,000 years ago, sometimes they have crystallized. So you can sometimes see the phase transition. This is why they are so beautiful, because they have patina due to their reflection from the crystal layers. So on a human time scale, you get a solid. Now, mechanical yield, as we have uh, heard in the last section, uh, last uh, session, can be, in fact, catastrophic. You know about earthquakes, right, Jim? You know about earthquakes. I don't, but you do. Uh, we know about mudslides, we know about avalanches, but as Alan before showed us, it's, I think it's the same picture, right, of a uh, cylinder of a metallic glass under stress, and suddenly the homogeneous stress that we put on this cylinder uh, concentrates on one plane, and pfft, the thing breaks. The phenomenon is rather ubiquitous and universal in some sense, in the sense that you look at very many different uh, glasses or amorphous solids, and all of them has the same looking stress versus strain curve. That is to say, at small strains, this, by the way, is quasi-static, and at small strains, you have a sort of elastic response in the sense that the stress, measured stress as a function of the strain, is increasing sort of linearly. It bends, but you know, sort of increases. And then there is a transition into a state we call the steady state, the steady state plastic flow, where even though you're increasing the strain, the stress cannot increase. 
Now, I have to say that I've spent some good years of my life asking a question, what is the difference between the material here and here? How does the system know that when it's here at the small values of the strain, when you increase the strain, it can still increase the stress? Whereas here, you increase the strain, says no, I cannot increase the stress, I flow. And you look at the systems here, this is from numerical simulations, so you can look at your heart content at the system here and the system there, and you do all kinds of things. Correlation functions, second, oh, Livne, how are you? Correlation functions, three order correlation, third order, fourth order, Voronoi tessellations, Delaunay triangulation, all the tricks of the trade, and you don't see any much difference between the systems here and here. Idan still believes that there is, but I don't know. I didn't see for many years, so I gave up. I even think that it's the wrong question. And I want to give you, in this talk, what I think is the right question, what is actually going on when you are at this point. So, as I say, what is the difference between the material before and after the yield? Since we have the same basic phenomenology, it appears irrespective of the microscopic interaction potential. You can do it with metallic glass, you can do it with Leonard Jones, you can do it with hard sphere, all kinds of things all look the same. Then we need a language in order to describe what is going on that is sort of independent of the microscopic detail. And that is what I want to do today. So we are seeking a universal language to describe, to describe the transition. So let me, before I go to this, make a little five minute a digression to what is plasticity at all in crystalline solids to help Alan next time to explain what an STZ is. Okay, at least the temperature zero. So for a crystalline thing, we know it's a glide of dislocations, it's a glide of defects. Every crystalline uh, material at finite temperature due to, temp to entropy must have defects, especially dislocations. When you strain a solid dislocation glide, it's a non equilibrium process, it takes out the energy. But the glass is disordered, there is no long range order. And then, since there is no long range order, then you don't have any. Uh, possibility to define a defect because there's no long range order, so there's nothing, no way to say what's a defect. And we heard the difficulties of trying to anyway find out what are soft spots and this, this, but it's not obvious. So what is plasticity in amorphous solids? Well, what I'm going to describe <coughs> started with Malandro and Lux. I personally have learned it, have learned it from Anael Lemaitre. And then we did a lot of work also with Idan to try to understand what is happening. So basically what you want to say is that if you have in zero temperature, you put a strain on a material. The strain that you put, that you choose, is determined by a so-called affine transformation. So this J, for example, can be all X go to X plus gamma Y, all Y goes to Y, Z goes to Z, so this is pure strain, for example. But when you have a... Uh, crystalline solid, if you do an affine transformation, that is it. Because you just stretch some of the bones, you quetch others, and the system is still in, in mechanical equilibrium. Not so in a glass. And you have a, a, what we call a non-affine response. To show this, it's a film that Idan has prepared for me how many years ago? Maybe 10 or 7 or something. And here is a typical amorphous arrangement of two types of particles. This is a, but by the way, these are, these are point particles, and the circle just shows the range of interaction. These are Leonard Jonesians. And now I'm going to do a affine transformation. So these arrows now describe how much I'm going to move these particles. So these don't move at all, and this is a y dependence linear, and these are going to move so much. I've done it. The system was in mechanical equilibrium before. Is it in mechanical equilibrium after? Of course not, because the system is amorphous. And therefore, now look what are the forces that have been created on every particle. The net force on every particle is dot zero because it is amorphous. So if you want to go back to mechanical equilibrium, you have to do the non-affine part, the UI. <coughs> and the non-affine part, oop, it, I just did it. Okay? So this is what you get. You get the combinations of affine and non-affine thing. So let me see whether I can say something about how much non-affine I will get. So let me start with the fact that I have a force Fi on every particle that is zero before and after. So I made now a change that I, uh, I uh, parameterized by gamma. So this J, this affine transformation will be 
parameterized by subgamma, for example, in simple shear, it's just the strain. And we know that dFi d gamma is zero. It was zero before, it was zero after. But the force Fi is nothing but minus d energy of all the particles, dRi. Okay, so that's the force. And this is the d gamma. So I have now a strange double derivative, one a partial and one full. Now, since this is a linear relation between xi and ui to linear order, whether I take du dri or du dy, it doesn't matter. So now let's uh, interpret this double derivative. It has two contributions. One because u itself depends on gamma, and the other one because the non-affine part depends on gamma. So I can now break it into two contributions. The u itself depends on gamma, so I get a partial derivative of this with u d gamma dui, and then chain rule, because since uj depends on gamma, then I have another d squared u, dui duj, duj d gamma. And this has to be zero. Now, notation. This is a famous matrix. It's known as the Hessian matrix Hij. This is a less known object, but it's known as the non-affine force. It has only one index, so let's call it psi i. And here's the duj du d gamma, and I wanted to understand how much non-affine I have, so I have to uh, invert this equation to get du j d gamma. Can I invert it? Well, that depends. If the matrix H i j is good, stable, it has only positive eigenvalues, I can invert and get an answer. So let us look what happens to the eigenvalues. Generically, what you have is that some of the eigenvalues of this matrix, when you change gamma, when you do a strain, don't care much. But there are some eigenvalues whoop, that go through a disaster. So that when you do this, an eigenvalue can go to zero at some value of the external strain. Let's call it gamma p. And this is where, at this point, I'm not going to be able to invert. And this is the catastrophe. This is the plastic event. This is the STZ. Now, as long as I can invert, let's now go before it goes to zero. So let me still invert. Dui d gamma is h minus 1 times psi. And now I can take the xi, it's a nice vector, I can expand it in the eigenvalues of hij. So I'm expanding in psi, <coughs> psi k, okay, and so this is the psi k dotted on psi, and this is the thing itself, this is the amplitude, this is the eigenvector. And since the eigenvectors now appearing in the denominator, when one of them is going to zero, this sum is going to be dominated by one eigenvalue, the eigenvector, the one that is associated with the lowest eigenvalue lambda p, and therefore I can now predict that my uh, non-affine uh, response is going to be proportional to the eigenfunction that is associated with this eigenvalue. Now, how these eigenfunctions look? Well, it's very interesting because when you're here at zero, all these eigenfunctions are delocalized. They're everywhere. But when you come close to a plastic instability that you can always say, you can always show <coughs> this goes like a square root singularity because it's a generic instability. It's a saddle node, so this is one of the well-known um, catastrophes. So it goes like a square root. When you do this, the eigen eigenfunction localizes. And it localizes on what Allen and others like to call an STZ. So an STZ is when some particles are moving out and some particles are moving in. This is the famous quadrupolar uh, Ashelby thing that by amazing chance is the same thing. Not amazing chance, really. But it's equivalent to what Ashelby has computed in the 50s for a sphere that you get out, you squish into a... Uh, ellipsoid and you push it back. Same solution analytically. Okay, so this is an isolated plastic event and it occurs all along this, el hi Oven, you, and it goes all along this elastic branch that you see, but you know, small, small, small sort of, how do you call them? Wiggles, right? But then at some point, puff, these guys like to appear together and they are correlated over a long distance and this is very interesting because you start from a single quadrupolar structure that when you go to infinity decays to infinity like a parallel and that's it. When they appear in a structure, they appear in two dimension in a line and three dimension in a plane and now you see there is outgoing and incoming but now the outgoing is connected to the incoming, the outgoing is connected to the incoming, etc. So you now get a global connection with these guys that don't go into infinity. And this makes a displacement field goes this way here, this way here. That's the shear band. 
And the question is, how is it that we suddenly get correlation over the whole system? Now, you may remember 20 years ago, there was a person by the name of Pierre Bach, who whenever something has become long range, he said self-organized criticality. Now, I, I don't know about you guys, I never understood what is self-organized criticality. <laughs> So I want to put a finger here on what is the actual criticality that is, so there is criticality here, but we need to understand how to do it. So we need to construct an order parameter in order to do a theory. Now an order parameter in a disordered system is an axiomoron unless you talk with uh, Giorgio Parisi in Roma, because that's his business. So what I'm going to discuss now is something that Corrado Rainone, where are you, Corrado, has imported from Rome, and this is the idea of replica. So let me explain the idea of replica. You have two systems that are actually the same system replicated. What do I mean? You have a system where you have particles i going from 1 to n, and these particles are i, you designate now an index to every particle in the replicum 1. Then, if you have a replicum 2, you have the same particles with the same designation, not necessarily at the same place. Okay, so we have now Ri2. So you have two replica, and they can be either all the same place or some different, etc. And what you now introduce is an order parameter that we call the overlap, Q12, which is made from the step function of the distance between Ri in replicum 1 and I, uh, R, uh, Ri in replicum 2, and to tolerance A. So if this distance is smaller than A, then the step function is unity. If the distance is larger than A, the step function is 0. And therefore, this object can go between 0 and 1. If all the particles are within the tolerance, each one close to its replicum, uh, thing, then you have uh, one from each pair, uh, but uh, you have one over n, so you get one, or uh, if you have no overlap, so all these are zeros, then you get zero. So Q12 is at most between zero and one. Okay, now this is a transparency that, or a slide I wanted to concentrate on because it's the, it's the heart of the trick. So what I want to do now is use this replica to understand something new. So start with the glass former. You choose you know, any one of these models that everybody plays with. Uh, start with the glass former in the liquid state at high temperature, at some temperature above the glass transition. So the system, you can do molecular dynamics, it's running around. Stop it, freeze it for a moment, freeze it, and take a configuration. Quench that configuration to zero temperature. Okay? I don't care how you do it. Molecular dynamics, this fast, this slow, it doesn't matter. Now, heat up to a low temperature. Let's say in Leonard Jones, T equals 0 0.2 because the glass transition, so to speak, is around 0.5 or 0.46 or something, much below the glass transition. Now you have that the system is sort of running a little bit with molecular dynamics at some temperature, but every particle is sort of within a cage. Pick up one configuration at this t equals 0 0.2, one configuration in space. And now randomize the velocities, let's say 500 times. Of course, you could do it 1,000 times or 2,000 times. We are lazy, we do it only 500 times. With the Boltzmann weight at this temperature 0 0.2. And quench again each one of those. Each one of those you randomize, and now you quench each one of those to temperature 0. So you have 500 things. This creates what we call a patch of configurations. Okay, so again, you have a system that is at temperature 0 0.2. You select one spatial configuration. You randomize the velocities. Since the quench depends on the velocities, you don't fall exactly on the same thing. And you create a patch. Now repeat this, let's say, 100 patches. Okay, do the whole procedure again and again and again, let's say 100 times. Of course, if you are brave, do 200, 300, 500, whatever. This is not to have good statistics. And now the trick. So I have now a patch of configurations. I'm going to show you they're all very close by because of this procedure. They say the Q12, or between all of them, is of the order of 1. So here it what happens when you strain. This is now a different system sizes, and I'm going to say something about the system size dependence. But the point is this. You look at Q12 when the strain is 0. And now you increase the, the strain, and you see that, yeah, at some point, 
sort of, this is the stress versus strain curve. So you see, at the point you suspect there is some transition, indeed there is some transition. All these guys are getting far away from each other. Okay? So far, when you are in the elastic range, they are close, 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 close. And suddenly they see, wow, I can go here, I can go there, I can go there, and they all separate from each other. So what I like to call this is, uh, today I want to call it stressed ergodization, in the sense that you get ergodized, but at a given stress. So it's not full ergodization. Now, you see this is the system size, so this is when the system is small, becomes sharper and sharper and sharper. You want to quantify it, so you look at the maximum slope. The maximum slope, so you look at the slope, you pick the thing at its maximum, and you, for example, this curve, this is the slope, you find the maximum slope, and you now plot the maximal slopes as a function of the system size, and you have a very nice parallel, as you expect in a real transition, like in the first order transition. So yield is something like a stressed ergodization, in the sense that the huge vista is opening up at the yield which you didn't have as long as you were sort of in the elastic regime. How do I know that all of them? I can count. So I told you we have 500 configurations each patch. I have 100 uh, patches, so I have 50,000 configurations, and I'm just measuring. So this is, again, the stress versus strain curve. And this is the number of configurations whose Q12 goes below some threshold, 0 0.8 or something. And you see at this point, whoop, you get a huge increase all the way to 50,000. So all of them separate from each other. OK. But now, <coughs> you see, I'm really aiming at an increase in correlation length. Now, tell me, wait, this is a first-order transition. So usually in first-order transition, there is no increase in correlation length. Okay, usually. Now I want to explain why here we do. So since we have enough initial configurations, we can consider the probability to see the order parameter. Okay, because we can do things. And now we see something very interesting. You see, this is already near the transition. Far away, you have a peak around 1. Far away, you have a peak around 0. But here, you have a very nice change where the probability to see the order parameter is at values close to 1 as long as you are not at a transition, and then close to 0 when you already passed the transition. But now look at this point. Look at this green line. There is a almost flat region. What is this flat region? In the theory, first order transition, this is a spinodal point. So you see, if I have said I have a PDF, if instead of PDF I ask what is the uh, effective free energy that is associated with this, well, it's a double well when I have the two peaks more or less the same, like here in the red, okay, the red line. But then there'll be some point where this is going to flatten. When you get flattened, this is the spinodal point. You are, losing, you, you are getting only one phase stable. The other one has no stability at all. Which, where is, where is I mean, see, when this gets flat, yes. this is flat. Okay? It's not flat. It's, you should get this, uh, so there is one, one deep and one flat, right? The free energy. This is the deep, so it has this, and this is the, the flat. No, because this is the PDF. This is the free energy. Ah, yeah. If I had the free energy. Okay, so this is known, this known as the spinodal point. Now, spinodal point is never seen in any experiment because it's a finite temperature. All experiments that we know with spinodal, like uh, binary uh, fluids, uh, etc., you cannot see this point because you're going to jump before. You have maximal construction, etc. Here we have a thermal. We have a-thermal, and therefore we can actually sit there as long as we want. We can stabilize this on the critical point. So this is where you are uh, in the Maxwell construction point, where that's the same, but this is now a point where you are at a spinodal and you have a zero mass in the field theory sense or an infinite correlation length in the thermodynamic sense. So how do we solve this? So this is a recent paper uh, <coughs> that was published uh, recently in PLUS. And the idea now, how do you show that you indeed have such a, a transition and such a, a spinodal with an increase in, in correlation function, in, in correlation <laughs> length, I'm sorry. You have now localized the uh, 
overlap function uh, QAB by multiplying what I had before by a delta function, R minus RIA or R minus RIB, since RIA and RIB sh should be close in order not to have zero, it doesn't matter. Now you have a field. And now you can determine correlation function of this field. Now there's a huge amount of theory behind this square or rectangle, but let me tell you, you can identify, theoretically, what are the interesting correlation functions that you, you, that you should look at. You should look at. Uh, one is known as the replicon, the other no, known as the longitudinal correlation function, doesn't matter that the names. The point is that you have explicit formula for all these correlation functions. This is the replicon, this is the, the gamma 2. Note that they are depending on more than two a replica, for example, this is QAB, QAB, this is QAB, QAC, this is QAB, QCD, etc. But the most important point, these are four-point correlation functions, because every Q is already uh, comparing two systems, so it's already two-point, so these are four-point four uh, correlation functions. And the prediction is that these objects are those that are going to show an increase in correlation length when you come near a spinodal. You can also, of course, define a susceptibility that should be divergent at that point, etc. And all these things can be measured and shown. So, for example, I'll show you here the replicon, a cut through the replicon. This is in two-dimensional two uh, systems. So you look at x equals 0 as a function of y. This is when you're far away from criticality, from the spinodal criticality. And then the correlation length is increasing, increasing, increasing. Here you see the correlation length measured from this uh, as a function of the system size. So here it doesn't grow that much, grows more, grows more, and it's going to diverge in the thermodynamic limit. And you can show that as a function of the distance from the spinodal point, you have a nice uh, correlation, a nice uh, Parallel with an exponent that at this point we still do not understand, uh, but is an exponent that is very clear. You have uh, sufficient data <coughs> to show that there is indeed such a divergent correlation length, and there's going to be a lot of work to understand this exponent and compute it from theory, etc. But you know, you have the phenomenon. So basically, uh, this is what you see at temperature zero. Now you'd ask me, well, temperature zero, what happens when the temperature is finite? Well, uh, in spinodal systems, as I said before, a spinodal point can never be s stabilized. So let's see what happens. So here, I repeat these uh, PDFs for the, um, for the average uh, Q12, and you see that there's a nice uh, transition. You put a low temperature, and it begins to muck it up. You can still see this. At a high temperature, you lose the transition altogether. There's always one average PDF that is becoming this and this. So, you know, of course, when you're going to have sufficiently high temperature, the phenomenon is not going to be visible. But still, I think there is a big range of temperature between zero and something sensible where this is useful. Thank you very much for your attention. That's because of the uh, slowing down. Huh? That's because of slowing down that everything becomes so slow. Interesting yeah. comment, yes. That's right. Okay, that's because you cannot jump because it, yes. it, it, it's very slow. Good point. Yeah. You related this uh, yield phenomenon <coughs> to the appearance of zero eigenvalues of the Eshin? That's for the single plastic event. Uh, you know, this is the shear band is also an instability, but it's much more complex. And this is why you need to go through all these things to understand okay, so generally what's happening okay, here. I understand. So my question is, why this zero eigenvalue appears at large stress? Why it doesn't appear when, when this gamma is zero? That's because of Anderson. So uh, Anderson, Phil Anderson predicted that when you have a random system with randomness is going to be localization. But the localization is only the high energies. <coughs> so at zero strain, when you are at mechanical equilibrium, the localization never appears at the low end. This is a non-equilibrium localization that really needs an additional external field, which is here the, the strain. So it's a localization that has never been studied before 
this group of people, you know, but uh, it's a interesting new localization compared to what was predicted in 1950s, and uh, it's not fully yet uh, clear how to separate it from the buy modes and all these things, but I it's there. It's a phenomenon that is there. <coughs> so, um, is it a reasonable interpretation that when this eigenvalue goes to zero, yeah. you're more or less proving that at that point linear response uh, functions just don't work? Of course. Right? Of course. Elasticity must fail. Of course. Yeah. Of course. You know, this is exactly the definition, right? Because elasticity, stable elastic thing, necessitates a spectrum that is positive. And uh, this is the first point, or n not next, next, next. It, it, it can happen again and again and again. But this is where uh, stability is being lost, and you must have some rearrangement, some instability. Yeah. So, Mark? Yeah. Yeah, so um, I think when people talk about shear bands, sometimes we're using the same language to talk about different things. And so. You know, when we do these simulations, particularly in these very suddenly quenched systems, and even in the deeper quenched systems, you see mechanical, uh, the triggered events that involve uh, propagation across the system, but that doesn't always lead to a persistent flaw. Right? Good, good point. So you, yeah, good point. No, no, it's yeah. it's a good point, and it and it brings me this question to another issue. Mm -hmm. How do you see this in experiments? Or in, I mean, if you don't see, making replicas in experiment is impossible, right? So there is an interesting question that I don't know the answer for, but relates to what you ask. What happens when you come close to the spinodal? Will you begin to see finite size shear bands or sort of uh, not fully uh, uh, saturated infinite uh, correlation length? And can you, for example, determine the exponent by looking at this? So. I don't know the answer, but I think that your question leads to that issue. Because the question is how close are you to the spinodal point where, by necessity, you need to see an infinite uh, event. So I'm wondering if we can wrap the beginning back around to the end and then Is it about the system that lets it know internally okay, right. that it will not sustain right. any more stress? Good, good. So now, having done all this stuff at the end, how do you answer that question? Okay, so my answer to this is as follows. When you are quenching the, the system, even 500 system, a million system, they're all in a quasi-stable, how do you call this, inherent state. Okay? And now, when you are straining them, they don't see much. They look around and they see, you know, a barrier. And the barriers sort of sometimes disappear locally. And you say, ah, I can come here. Okay? And there is the plastic event that is local. Okay? But this is just one direction in phase space. What happens there is an instability where suddenly open many, many <coughs> directions in phase space, and all, every single replicum here sees that it can go somewhere. So you have an ergodization. It's not that if you now take one of them and you ask, how is it different from what it was before, density would be the same, second order correlation function is going to be the same, but that's not the, the issue. The issue is that you have now many paths that are being opened to the system. So I want to call it stressed ergodization. I don't know whether this name helps, but I think this is what you catch here. You catch here a situation that you are uh, non-ergodic and stuck in a particular region of the phase space as long as it didn't open up, and now you have a huge vista, including many unstable configurations that are there. that will be, you know, unable, each one of them, to make more stress increase. That's my picture. I want to follow up on that, because what you just described, the fact that you do small stability over a small thing. Not small, the shear bending yeah, instability, yeah. yeah. No, 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 no. I mean, you have to think about these replicas. Yeah, Each one of them. Okay, so now you have to think about the hemodynamic limit, and every region is a replica, right? So, of course, you know. Yes. Correct, correct. Also, that system will have a huge vista opening up. That's correct. But you don't see this with your parameter. You cannot calculate no, no. <coughs> the other parameter for, for a given system. 
I know. But the physics is the same. Let's just say your single system of 50,000 or 10,000 particles is within a, a inherent state, and it opens up at this point. And it can go here, it can go there, it can go there, and then suddenly, you know, it makes a, a transition to a state that you have no uh, possibility to increase the stress because every allowed configuration is there, including many unstable ones. So sometimes, yes, you still will have a small increase in the distress if you really uh, open up your microscope, but it's not going to persist. Yuda. No, 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 no. I mean, let me ask you the, let, let me answer you. The elastic moduli can be computed from these objects. For example, the shear modulus, you know, we have an exact formula that on top of the Born term, which is the elastic contribution to the shear modulus, there is a chi dot h minus one chi. So if you know the chi and the h, you can predict the shear modulus. And indeed, it'll go, something will ha happen to it when a lambda goes to, to uh, uh, zero, and it has to, right? Because suddenly you're, you're not elastic and you have a plastic event. This is interesting issue, the existence of these lambdas. You have to, you have to be very uh, careful because this is for a small system. When you have a large system, they, bega they begin to accumulate, and you have a density of guys. And then the question is, are your moduli at all defined? And it's very interesting to understand that even though the shear modulus has an h minus 1, has 1 over lambda in there, and all the lambdas are coming close to, to 0, it still exists. And the reason is, is because it's protected by the density. This is a, a work of Idan and George, uh, etc., that we did. And you can show that the shear modulus still exists in what sense? That if you look at a small system, the shear modulus, of course, has a distribution. You make larger and larger system, distribution becomes narrower and narrower and narrower and becomes a delta function in the thermodynamic limit. Not so for any higher order modulus. So nonlinear theory is in big trouble. If you open Landau and Lifshitz, you would expect that the stress can be expanded in mu times gamma plus something times gamma squared plus something times gamma cube. Those some things are now not proportional to h to minus 1, but h to minus 3, h to minus 5, and these go berserk. So the density of states no longer uh, protects them, and we showed already 2011 that nonlinear elasticity does not exist in this. And this is connected to many interesting things that people are thinking about, like the Gardner transition, where you expect indeed to lose nonlinear elasticity, but this is a different subject, this is a different lecture, but very interesting. Uh, yeah. What is what? The length scale is L. Oh, it's about a third of the typical length. So in Leonard Jones, for example, it's a third of, of the but cutoff. You, you Doesn't matter. You can change it quarter, half, you know. It makes no difference. Short question. Sure. You know, you started with this picture. And this picture of shear with fixed points, which very similar to the No fixed points. What do you mean fixed points? No. Uh, quadrupoles. Uh, unstable, yeah. Unstable, stable orbits. <coughs> Direction, yeah, uh, in the... Very similar to what's going on <coughs> at Kelvin Horowitz's stability in liquid. Yes. Then this trajectory curve, and you produce uh, same limit cycle. It isn't something... This picture related to... <coughs> this doesn't... Here I understand that it no. can be related to Kelvin Horowitz. Let me explain. This was for a single one, this one. Okay, so this was for the instabilities that occur along the so-called elastic branch. Yeah. This is another instability where they appear as a shear band. What uh, Alan talked yeah, about is different, yeah. different, yeah. Okay. But, 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 but you know, yeah. And this is why, in order to understand the existence of this infinite correlation length, you have to go through all this picture that I tried to because describe no, here. In this case, in uh, really it is a fluidization. Is Victor, it is a kind of fluidization. Maybe it's possible to write more than Maybe. V very interesting comment, yeah. Because it is a kind of fluidization. Any other questions? Everybody's clear. I think I have a stupid question. Ah! No, really. I love them, yeah. Uh, you, 
you build your ensemble by randomizing the velocities? Before you quench, yes. So this means when you quench, you don't fall on exactly the same uh, configuration, but close by. You make a patch of close by configurations, and you check that indeed the overlap uh, function is of the order of unity. So that they indeed close by. They're not the same. It's not unity but it's close to unity, 0.99 or, or whatever, the overlap function. Only when you strain, it continues to be unity, 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 and then yeah. But that, that strain is not a method that were a good method to randomize the quench a bit? Yes, I mean, yes, that, that's, yes. That's what yes, to get to yes. For example, for a, 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 a example, we are now, uh, we're now trying to work on a collapse and instabilities in granular media, a frictional granular media. Then you cannot do this trick because there's no thermal <laughs> ensemble. So you need to think about other ways of creating a patch. Okay, but this is very useful when you have a system that is thermal. It's just what you want to do. Yeah. Uh, you never do quantum. It's God forbid, H bar is zero so in my laboratory. To, to understand the localization. <laughs> It doesn't matter. Localization due to randomness is, uh, is a phenomenon that is more general than, than the single electron localization. You know, also now everybody's doing many body localization. It's no longer understood. It's very typical. When you have this order, then you don't have egodization. Then you don't have necessarily a, uh, you know, a theory that uh, seeks all the phase space in, an, in a democratic way. Sound localization. There are many, many, many examples of localization that are not necessarily quantum. But what I wanted to stress is that that localization <coughs> always occurs in the high eigenvalues, high energies. This is atypical in the sense it occurs in the low, even the lowest. And this is a result of real simulations. This is results of theory and sim simulations, yes. Is there any geometric of what? There is a geometric interpretation of the psi. You see, the eigenfunction that comes about, you can interpret it. <laughs> this is, in fact, you can argue, is the cheapest possible way to release stress locally. You just, it's known as the T1 process. Some particles going out, some particles are going in, is what uh, Michael sees in the simulations. Everybody sees this, you know. This is the cheapest one. This is much more expensive. And this is why you need to go to a higher strain in order to see it. Yeah, you can actually compute the self-energy. Let me show you another way of understanding this or shedding light on this uh, transition. You can easily compute, because we know the analytic form of, of, of these guys, what is the energy that is associated with a creation of one. And it's finite, and you need to put that uh, energy in, and then you release it, you lose it when there is a plastic instability. Yeah, this fellow... Every point you know. Sorry? At every point. Yeah, you can compute. It's all computable. And, uh, you, you know, so that what are the contributions to the energy, the, <coughs> the, the background, and the creation of this? Now you can ask why this will happen energetically. And it's very interesting that as a function of the density, the energy is always increasing as a function of density if you have more than one, when gamma is smaller than the gamma yield, and it just reaches zero when gamma equals gamma yield. So energetically, we understand what it is. But we wanted to have a picture in the language of uh, statistical mechanics and thermodynamics that will yeah, that'll be equivalent to that. All right. Let's thank Itamar again.